Welcome everyone to this issue briefing on humanitarian response in Ukraine. Welcome to those in the room and to those of you online. My name is Hiba Ali. I'm the CEO of The New Humanitarian, which is a news organization that reports about conflicts and disasters around the world. And we have been covering the conflict in Ukraine uh, since 2014, actually long before uh, Russia's invasion. Of course, um, well, we, we saw the devastating effects even back then, but they have certainly escalated since. We are seeing um, millions of people displaced, uh, food production around the world affected, um, huge damage to civilian infrastructure, and as many of you know, the list goes on. So today we're going to look at how um, particularly Ukrainians are uh, responding to the humanitarian crisis and uh, where we go from here, how the needs have evolved um, and what the longer term plan looks like. A reminder for those of you who are um, tweeting on your social channels that you can use the hashtag WEF22. So we have three Ukrainians with us here today. I can tell you that they traveled um, through quite a journey to get here, a 14 hour train uh, to Warsaw, a plane to Zurich. 19-hour train, there you go. Um, but they felt it was, as you told me yesterday, important to keep um, a spotlight on Ukraine um, in the midst of, of what you feel is already dwindling attention. Uh, we have two members of parliament. So right next to me is Yevhenia Kravchuk, who is the deputy head of the Servant of the People Party, the President's Party in Parliament. Um, and next, well, on the far end, um, also from the Servant of the People Party, Ruxalana Pidlasa who is the deputy chair of the Parliamentary Committee on Economic Development. And in the middle, we've got um, Feder Serdyuk, who quit university to join uh, the Red Cross rescue team after the Ukrainian revolution. He then went on to found a company that provides um, health and safety consulting for businesses. And he's now ended up uh, as basically everyone as part of the civilian humanitarian response. So I want to start with you, uh, Ruxulana. Um, you're an MP as I said, focused on economic development. How did you end up managing a humanitarian hub in the west of Ukraine? I think that my story is very similar to the story of millions of Ukrainians who um, one day on the 24th of February, we woke up to the bombing of our native cities, to our to the places we lived. I woke up at 4 a.m. I went to the parliament to vote for the um, introduction of um, of, of the wartime and then uh, well we didn't know what to do and the legislation didn't seem to be in the focus back in the time and many people evacuated to the west on the first days of the war uh, and we realized that uh, being in the west is an excellent opportunity to enhance the uh, volunteer organizations that started for working from the very first day they started working on the on bringing humanitarian aid to ukraine and i saw the opportunity to help them because because initially uh, many people in Europe were reluctant to, uh, well, they wanted very much to help, but they didn't know how to help. And when the member for parliament steps in and says that, uh, I know these people, they are um, trustworthy organization, it helps to uh, build this connection, to build the trust and to bring uh, more aid to Ukraine. That's why we started this uh, hub and um, we continue working with it uh, today. But um, I want to emphasize that uh, it's one of the thousands of similar initiatives in Ukraine and grassroots movement is enormous now. And it's not only government to government action, it is um, it is mainly not government to government action. It is uh, NGO sector working on bringing the aid to Ukraine. It is uh, it is municipal uh, efforts and also the many um, members of the parliament and deputies of different levels are working on that today. Great, thank you. And I, I'll try to come back to you later to better understand how the international community can kind of tap into that volunteer effort. But I want to turn first to um, Yevhenia. Uh, can you give us a, a bit of a sense of the how the humanitarian needs have evolved in the country since the beginning of the crisis to now? Um, I guess across a, a number of categories, you've got displaced people that are in areas that are not occupied, you've got um, areas that have been recently liberated, you've got uh, people who are still under Russian occupation. So across that range, where are you seeing the most urgent needs? Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, I will... Uh, 
the very beginning will give you some numbers to understand uh, that uh, I, I don't think there is a family in Ukraine that was not affected uh, by this war. Uh, and uh, Ruxalana just you know, said that uh, there are hundreds, thousands of similar cases, uh, what she did. Uh, One-fifth of all of the population of Ukraine became volunteers of some sort, you know, bring, bringing stuff, finding people who are in need. So it's uh, truly, you know, a national war. It's not that like military is fighting and, and everyone is watches. Everyone in Ukraine uh, does something to bring the victory closer. Uh, now we have uh, 12 million people that uh, are displaced, 5 million outside of the country. We do not call them refugees because refugees, they just sort of, you know, uh, giving their passport, they say, I'm not coming to my motherland. They are uh, externally displaced people, just people seeking asylum and want to come back. Uh, also have 7 million of internally displaced people that went from south, from eastern territories, from central territories, like from Kiev at, at the very beginning to the west and to other, you know, uh, safe places in central Ukraine. So I would cover it uh, to like three stages of humanitarian needs and, and crisis. Uh, first of all, the uh, territories that are uh, um, under control of Ukrainian government. By the way, we have fully operational government, parliament, local councils, and that's very important as it differs Ukraine of uh, you know many many wars and conflicts uh, throughout uh, years. Um, so in in these places, you have uh, like these additional seven million people that will need to find a place to live, a hospital to go, uh, to, you know, a school uh, online, uh, to, to join a school online. Uh, and uh, but, but that's, you know, the, the very more modest uh, stage of uh, humanitarian needs. Uh, and then you have the uh, fully, uh, the, the liberated, recently liberated uh, cities. I mean, you've seen the pictures of Bucha, of Borodyanka, of, of this Kiev region, of uh, small cities, uh, small villages in Kharkiv region that was liberated. It. Uh, you know, they are ruined. No electricity, no ga gas. I mean, people stayed in basements without food, water for, for weeks, without electricity, without uh, possibility to call uh, the relatives saying that, you know, I'm alive. Um, and, uh, you know, first what you need, of course, bringing food, uh, hygiene, medicine, uh, and uh, putting, you know, electricity, gas uh, back. And then you have these occupied territories. For example, Kherson region is now uh, freshly occupied. Uh, and that's not a humanitarian crisis. That's a humanitarian hell. Uh, Russians are not letting any help to these regions. People want to leave these regions. They would stand in the field for five days in their cars, and Russians are not letting them out. That's, you know, in Kherson region. Luhansk Oblast, Donetsk Oblast is being erased from the face of the earth. It's literally hell over there. And what is, you know, the, my um, message here? The closer is Russia, is the, the worse is humanitarian situation. Uh, you know, it's, it's as easy as that. We need to kick out Russians from our country. Uh, what is it that can be done in those areas that are, while the Russians are still there, in those areas that are occupied? Um, you know, when I'm being asked, what is the, you know, best humanitarian aid for Ukraine? I'm sorry to say, but I, I say it's weapons. It's heavy weapons to kick Russians out because you can't bring a relief to these people that are at, at occupied territories. I mean, they're being tortured. Uh, children being raped. I mean, we have cases of two years old kids raped in, uh, in Kharkiv region. Uh, uh, you know, the only way to give relief to these people is to uh, liberate land and to kick out occupiers from, from, this, uh, from this territory. Feder, you're providing a different kind of aid. Um, you've trained the army, police officers, medics, volunteers to do um, first aid and, and emergency response, mostly on your own dime. About 4,000 people have been trained uh, since this latest invasion, but uh, 50,000 since 2014. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing on the ground? What kind of challenges are you facing? Um, the, the things uh, we see now in Ukraine is, um, is an, an enormous storm for medical system, uh, especially for the trauma system, because we have many casualties, uh, first of all, the military and defense forces, but also a huge number of civilian casualties. So 
as um, <clears throat> Russia uses the weapons of um, wh which are not um, precise, they use artillery mainly. The uh, more than seventy percent of the casualties uh, have uh, the shrapnel wounds, so not bullets, uh, and you are not able to to control where uh, rockets are flying. So they cover, they shell actually the huge areas. So you receive one time a lot of casualties at the same time. So the response of the first responder is critical because the, like 70% or more of uh, <clears throat> the preventable deaths, preventable fatalities, I mean, people who could be saved, they die from the severe bleeding. And bleeding kills a person very fast, in three to five minutes, um, <clears throat> sometimes 10. Uh, so our task is to have, as we do not know where Russia will strike, they can strike a market, they can strike a street, they can strike a military base. Also, they sometimes pick up military targets eventually. Why not? So they mainly attack civilians, but sometimes military. Um, <clears throat> our goal is to have people ready to stop the bleeding and to apply first aid, open the airways, uh, close the pneumothorax wounds on the chest in three to five minutes. So we need a lot of first responders and we need a lot of equipment everywhere. Russia can strike. So almost everywhere through the, uh, our um, line of, um, of the war zone. So our goal now and what we, the problems that we experience, what we see is that we're running out of equipment because every medic or every first responder needs to ta have first aid kit for himself and for many casualties because there are artillery strikes and there are like a mass casualty event. And though we have to have a load to recharge because every time medic runs out of equipment, he needs more equipment. Uh, so basically what we need is a first aid equipment for medics and first responders and for soldiers and even for civilians. And um, it is a question of time when the, um, the hospitals will run out of equipment too, uh, more advanced. We receive enormous support in terms of medicine. We have a lot of different medical equipment coming from Western countries and some other countries. Uh, I, we appreciate it. But um, the, the warfare is irregular, so we do not know where the next track would be placed and the logistics failed, you know, so Russia bombs the uh, roads and bridges, so we are not able to move this equipment really fast, as fast as we need. So we really need a lot of equipment to be prepared. I'm, uh, we talked earlier about the volunteer response. That's been a huge part of, of the effort in Ukraine, and we are hearing um, in our reporting about trauma, about burnout among the volunteers. Um, we heard from one international peace building organization that local volunteer coordinators were working, you know, 50 hours a week um, to manage these masses of volunteers. You've been doing this now for three months, Feder. How long can you last? Is this sustainable? Uh, well, I do not want to say I'm naive, but we will last until our victory because we have no other chance. I mean, in, uh, in the ideal circumstances, we'll have way different system that we have now and way different answers that I give you now. Um, and it is definitely not okay that my people who are teaching thousands of people, risking their lives and uh, like working from, from early morning to late of night, they work as volunteers. But, uh, but um, it is a challenge now to secure resources enough to, to continue operation and uh, uh, we, we have the managerial capabilities to do so and we have the corporate social responsibility and we have international donors. Uh, so I believe, uh, I believe it is a question of time when we'll secure enough resources. Uh, so uh, what I believe in that we are now on transfer as we understand that the war will, um, will not end in the nearest time, it will continue until our victory and I'm sure of it again. Uh, we'll operate and we'll find a resource and, and reinvent the model to make it more sustainable. But what I want to mention also that the Western world and our partners from the civilized world from many countries, including like East and South or whatever, uh, they have now to make their decision either to send us tourniquets forever or to send us weapons now. Because the, what my health and safety experience shows that um, Prevention is always better than management. If you prevent the injury, you do not have to deal with it. And non-medical aid 
not the best doctor, if you would say, uh, send us the best Switzerland doctor or the professor, will save as much lives than the peace agreement, which only would be possible when Russia will be defeated. And um, I wanted to show you um, this helmet. It's a helmet from the volunteer who volunteer mobilized to, um, to fight Russia. So uh, he, he, is, he wasn't about to fight Russia, actually, because I don't believe he cared. He was about to protect his house. Whenever we're about to attack any country, we're fighting on our ground. It's impo important to understand. So we can have the best helmet and the best medicine and the best doctors. We train them really well now. But it will never save lives as effective as the peace agreement. And the peace agreement, without the destruction of the world order, rule-based world order again, is possible only with the defeat of the aggressor. Not with, like, relaxing the aggressor, not with, like, saving, protecting the face of the aggressor, but with defeat. That's why I am, as, as a person who really loves peace, who enjoys my peaceful life, I'm a, uh, listed to Forbes Europe, I'm listed to Ukraine, I really love my life, okay? So I don't want the war to continue. Yeah, to, to understand my motivation. I'm telling you now that that's the only option. And I'm sorry to tell that, but that's the only truth. And I want you to see this from the other side, right? So this is penetrated. I mean, you will never have enough of the protection, but the full prevention of the war. We fail to prevent it, but we still have the war every day. So we, it's never too late, right? But every day we're running out of, uh, of people, of equipment, of everything. So make the decision. We're sending tourniquets forever. We're sending weapons now. Hanyo, you wanted to yeah, I just in. wanted to jump in and support what Ferris said, because when we are speaking uh, in our, our panels about humanitarian crisis, this humanitarian crisis was not caused by a flood, by a tornado, by, um, I don't know, something natural. It was caused by a country called Russia with dictator called Putin, who brought uh, troops into our country. We're a peaceful nation. We don't need an inch of Russian soil. But if someone comes to our land, we will fight. We will fight until our victory. And the only way to stop these atrocities, to help the people who are wounded, who are um, hungry, um, who, who, who can't, you know, school, uh, kids. I mean, I have eight years old kid. During the night, she has to go to the basement because we have air alerts. And at nine in the morning, she turns on her laptop and go to online schooling. That's, you know, the, the life. But she's, you know, she's relatively safe. And today, an 11 years old girl from Donbass region died uh, because of Russian bombs and, and, and shelling. And she's the 233rd child that was killed by Russians in this war. And we have to stop it and to kick out the aggressor from our country. I will say, as someone who watches the humanitarian response system uh, very closely, it's very rare to hear uh, when you ask someone what are the humanitarian needs for them to respond, send us weapons. So this is a very different imagine. kind of <laughs> dynamic than we're used to hearing with aid agencies that insist on neutrality and not being part of the conflict and not taking sides. Um, but I think actually one that w uh, the international community often forgets is, is at play. Um, Ruxulan, I just want to come back to you on some of the wider implications of this crisis. Of course, it's been devastating for Ukraine, but it also has global implications in terms of food production and wheat supply. What do you think needs to happen in order to avert that kind of a global food crisis? Well, I will not be original. It all <laughs> comes weapons. to weapons. Um, but there are other ways, of course. Um, we do uh, talk in the world, and it's like the, the the global topic today the food security and you know that the economist uh, was out um, last week with the cover that uh, the world is uh, on the bridge on the on the uh, actually fringe of mass hunger because of Russia attacking attacking Ukraine because Ukraine is world largest producer of uh, grains and food and the countries in Africa and Asia are very dependent on Ukraine in terms of export and what Russia is doing right now. They are causing humanitarian crisis not only in Ukraine but also in the world and they are doing that deliberately. They want, Russia wants the world to suffer. 
from hunger, from poverty, and from uh, every possible thing, every worst thing that you could imagine. And they are doing this um, mainly by blocking Ukrainian seaports right now. The harvest that Ukraine um, collected last year, it is blocked in um, the ports of Odessa, it is blocked in Berdyansk, it is uh, blocked in Ily Ilychovsk and other, uh, which is Chornomorsk now, um, and other places, uh, even in the places that are not occupied right now uh, by Russian forces the Russian warships are on the raid in front of these uh, cities and they are not allowing any commercial ships to go to, to these ports to um, collect the harvest, to collect the grains and bring it back and uh, bring it to the other places. Uh, there are different, there are a couple of ways how the world could respond. We were talking about a lot with different trade organizations and with the UN as well about the um, ocean, well, the, the kind of operation that was uh, used in the Gulf of Aden, the ocean shield operation, when the NATO convoys were um, going with commercial ships to the ports to load them. It is one possibility, but also the, the another possibility is always uh, providing um, heavy weapons and miss anti-ship missiles for Ukraine so that Ukraine could protect their its own ports um, itself. Uh, it could go hand in hand together, it could be done separately, but we, um, it is important to understand that we must do something right now because um, the uh, situation is uh, decreasing, it's getting more and more severe, you know. Um, apart from the seaports, we also have a huge problem uh, with the fuels because Russia is deliberately bombing the uh, oil refineries in Ukraine, uh, destroying them so that uh, Ukrainian farmers could not uh, sow the grains this season so that there will be no harvest at all next season if they don't do that. And that would be the ideal situation for Russia because everyone in the world would be forced to buy Russian grain. Um, well, if the world wants to buy Russian grain, I'm sure they don't. Um, we have to respond right now and we don't have that much time now. Um, we're speaking, well, seaports is one thing, but we're also speaking about uh, humanitarian aid in terms of fuel, because while the Ukrainian market was very much dependent on Russia and Belarus in terms of uh, importing the uh, diesel and petroleum. While the market, commercial market, is shifting towards shipments from Europe, we have to um, work on the shipments from also public reserves from the West, from the European countries and from the US, because uh, the situation is quite urgent and we don't have time um, we don't have time to wait while the market will adjust on itself. We talked about fuel. Um, I, I'm going to put aside the weapons for a minute. Um, coming back to the actual needs, I mean, uh, what we often see in crises is that people send all kinds of stuff. And in this crisis, um, that's not an exception. So like 10,000 pairs of women's leggings, um, endless boxes of pasta without fuel to cook them. Um, I heard even of a truck full of brie cheese. So. Uh, what is your message as a government um, in terms of how you'd like the international community to coordinate with you when they do want to be helpful? Um, first of all, I'd like to repeat my message that we do have full opera uh, operational government and parliament and local councils. Uh, so it's it's not like the situation that, I don't know, United Nations helicopter is um, just uh, sort of uh, bringing uh, packs of food and, and, and putting them on the ground. Uh, we do have the system of bringing uh, the aid into the different regions and uh, the stocks and hubs uh, from which this help goes to the uh, communities that need the most. Uh, uh, of course, at the, the very beginning of, uh, of this full-scale invasion, uh, we had a lot of trucks with food and, and you know, this uh, water supplies, but uh, now the most urgent need is uh, medicine, is money. Uh, we need financial aid. 
because we spent so much uh, money on uh, on the war that I mean we need to finance the social uh, needs. We have these displaced people in uh, inside of the country. They uh, lost their jobs. Uh, they need to have uh, some sort of income. Our GDP uh, has dropped for 30 percent because our factories are bombed. Part of the territory is occupied. Uh, as Roxolana said, the fuel, the diesel, and petroleum, uh, uh, because we had to change the whole logistics of bringing these to Ukraine. And of course, uh, you know, the, there is a shortage of uh, petroleum and diesel uh, uh, right, right now. And I mean, for example, Poland gave. Um, um, can mix the number, but uh, a pretty much big amount of uh, petroleum from their reserves as a country. Uh, and also, uh, I think that, uh, as I said, I mean, I can call any minister or any, you know, like government, uh, go governor for, from the regions. If you want to, I don't know, um, uh, rebuild a school or rebuild a museum or, or, or try to save the cultural heritage or help the library, you can ask that and we'll help you to do the direct help to, you know, to concrete region, to concrete, uh, if you have, uh, I don't know, you, you, you want to help kids, we have the organizations, we have the Ministry of Social Affairs, we we will bring your help to the person that is uh, on the ground, enjoys working on the ground, and you know delivering this help directly. I think what we've heard certainly from the humanitarian community is if there was ever a crisis in which all of the pledges to localize aid delivery could become reality, it is this one because you have a functioning government, because you have so many resources in place. And if um, aid can't be localized in Ukraine, then when will it ever happen? So there's a call to that. Feder, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I wanted to add something. Uh, I believe you are uh, expecting for some uh, you know, suggestion for those millions of people all over the world who are willing to help. And we really have amazing support now. Um, I believe in uh, the power of uh, the horizontal surf organization, the decentralization, that's what really leads the world to success in my humble opinion in uh, the last years. And our system is anti-fragile. It proved itself to be anti-fragile because it's extremely decentralized. As uh, Eugenia mentioned before, like 20% of our citizen who stayed in the country are now volunteers. So, uh, what I does, Sorry to interrupt, how does the international community tap into that network? Um, there are some prominent organizations, one of them developed by the Ukrainian Global Shapers community called SUN, so uh, support Ukraine now. But um, generally, um, there are people from different countries on the ground, in the regions, different, I meet them in Odessa, in Mykolaiv, even very close to war zone, surprisingly close to war zone. They have actually, they're very brave. Uh, and uh, these people, they, uh, they pick up the leaders from the small organizations and then support them, and they have amazing results. It might not look that sustainable that we expect it to be, but they're extremely efficient because these people know the situation on the ground. And uh, we started our operations in Odessa, for instance, training military reserve there to move them back to combat and training the responders who responded the missile strikes. But then we had to move to Mykolaiv, and I traveled there, found a house, I go by this house, like starting doing my operation, met some people, and then I, like in three days, I understood all the rock stars of Mikolaev, Red Cross volunteers, rescue volunteers, international organizations. So, uh, what my suggestion is, if it goes direct, uh, to um, to support small volunteer organizations on the ground, especially Ukrainian, because these people are they have amazing motivation. And uh, thanks to World Economic Forum and international community, we now have this organization having its voice on international media. So if you are reading uh, Financial Times or Bloomberg or some, something else about the organization of three, uh, like 30 people, 300 people, not, not the, the huge one, uh, just Google them, support them, and you, you will really you will have a lot of appreciation from them. You will have amazing results from them and you will contribute. I'm not having anything against uh, big organizations, but um, this uh, irregular warfare means that smaller sometimes is better, and the flexible is better uh, for, I'm, I'm sure of it, you know, that the flexibility is the crucial for efficient response on humanitarian, especially humanitarian, not wartime issues now. Roxolana, last thoughts. 
I think I want to second what Fedor said. If you are if you are donating personally, donate locally, donate to small organizations because they are the most efficient and often the most reliable and less money will go to the bureaucracy of the big organizations. But I also would like to appeal to the uh, governments of uh, an intergovernmental institution and international organizations about our needs. Um, very quickly, we need fuel. Well, we need weapons. That's we already established. But also, we need fuel. Three hundred, three thousand, three. Uh, yeah, three hundred thousand tons per uh, month only for diesel. We need ambulances. We need fire trucks. We need temporary housing facilities because Russia destroyed thirty-eight million square kilometers of residential buildings, and we need demining facilities for newly liberated uh, towns and regions. Thank you. I just want to end with uh, Yevhenia. If you could give us um, very briefly thoughts on the longer term. We've talked a lot about immediate needs. Longer term, what are you thinking in terms of what needs to happen? Um, as we all said, uh, victory of Ukraine needs to happen. Uh, and then the sustainable, sustainable peace uh, cannot be without justice. We need to bring all of these uh, you know, soldiers and their command and up to, to political command to the responsibility. This evil cannot go unpunished because it will be repeating in other corners of the world. And I'm pretty sure that we will end up uh, creating a special tribunal as it was in Nuremberg after the Second World War. Because already we have the cases of 13,000 or four crimes committed in Ukraine. And you know, if we do not uh, end this war by winning, this number will grow and grow and grow. And the price tag for the lost infrastructure will grow as well. And of course, we'll need the new Marshall Plan uh, for Ukraine uh, to rebuild the country, to reestablish economy. And uh, Ukraine, I'm sure, needs to be uh, a part of European Union, a full member of European Union, because we chose these European values, we're dying for them, and we want to be inside of uh, the Union and be part of European family. Another example of how uh, humanitarian response can't really be separated from uh, the wider political and uh, military context. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to uh, the three of you for making a long journey and giving your insights on what's really happening inside the country. And um, there will be a special address by the Ukrainian president um, at 11.15, I believe, uh, today. So you can stay tuned for that as well. Thanks very much.